Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I praise Allah the Almighty alone and I send the best peace and blessings upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers everywhere, welcome to a new live edition of your program, Ask Huda. Our contact information is beginning with the phone numbers 002, area code 02385548 or 249. And the email addresses are ask at huda.tv, alternatively gardens at huda.tv. Barakallahu feekum. We'll be more than happy to start receiving your valuable questions and inquiries. And meanwhile, we have a couple of pending uh, questions in addition to a long list of emails, which we'll start tackling right away, inshallah. Uh, Sister Budi from... Uh, a brother Booty from the USA, from United States of America. He says, uh, my wife missed four days of fasting Ramadan due to her menses. And she called the Darul Ifta in Cairo who told her to simply pay the fidya for those days. I believe she should fast four days as well, but she disagrees. May I simply fast four days for her. Okay, uh, first of all, in ayah number 184 of Surah Al-Baqarah, in the course of mandating the fasting and how many days and who should fast and who is exempt from fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a continuation to the previous ayah, ayyaman ma'dudat, which means the fasting is prescribed in certain or counted number of days which is, as we know, either 29 or uh, 30 days. أَيَّامًا معدودات, The month of Ramadan. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ So whoever from amongst you is either sick or in a journey, then they should fast a like number of days some other time. After Ramadan, whenever they recover, or whenever they reside. Women during their menses must not fast nor pray during their menses, and they should make up the missed days. And that is in the sound hadith, that women should make up the missed days during Ramadan due to the menses, but they do not make up the prayers. And this is the ordainment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So simply, the opinion of simply not making up those days whether the person was sick, traveling, or women doing their menses and instead paying the fidya is invalid. And the person still must make up a like number of days, four, five, more or less. They should make up those days once they can make up those days. And they should not uh, simply waive that mandate by paying the fidya. The fidya is prescribed only in case that the person is either chronically ill where he or she are not expected to recover so the sickness is everlasting or if the person is senile or at an old age وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ but if the person is healthy, if the person is physically fit, but due to temporary circumstances of sickness, of traveling, or of demences for women, then they should make up the like number of days whenever the conditions improve. As far as your suggestion that in order to resolve the situation to fast those four days on her behalf, that's not valid because she is still alive. You cannot make up the fasting in her state. Only if the person died while he or she owed some fasting, they were capable to do it, but they did not, then it is prescribed for the ears of the family members to fast on behalf of the deceased, as it has been narrated 
in the hadith. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abu Zaki from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you sharing today? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, barakallahu feek. Yeah. And I have one question. Uh, can dua be read in our own language in the salat? No. And if so, which is the most uh, best time for dua in prayer? Please, can you give me any reference hadith or is it in sunnah? Uh, because uh, I, I said this thing uh, to my family nearest uh, relatives that I heard from uh, Sheikh that uh, the sajda, when, uh, during sajda, the man is more closer to Allah and uh, in our own language we can ask any dua. Yeah. But they say no, they check with one of the imam, local imam and they say no, they say no, only Arabic words can be read, uh, you cannot read this thing. Can you please give some uh, reference there? Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Wajazakum barakallah fikum Abu Zaki. Thank you so much. Uh, in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Amma uh, sujood fa aksiru fihi min ad-du'a faqamina an yustajaba li ahadikum. As far as for the sujood, the hadith is discussing what to do in ruku' and what to do in sujood. He said, as far as for the sujood, increase making du'a in your sujood. Since it is more worthy and it is most likely for one's dua to be accepted if he or she were to invoke Allah in their prostration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fattakullaha ma stata'tum. Fulfill your duties to Allah to the best of your ability, as much as you can do. And he says in Surah Al-Baqarah, La yukallifullahu nafsan illa mus'aha. Allah does not ordain any commandment on any person on any soul beyond their capacity. And in the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, ما أمرتكم به فأتوا منه ما استطعتم. Whatever I commanded you to do, do or fit as much as you can do. So now we have a situation which the dua, the invocation is most praiseworthy. And we have a situation where a person does not know Arabic. Should he or she make dua or should she stop or he stop because they can't make dua in Arabic? Keep in mind that the vast majority of the ummah are non-Arab. Indo-Pak, Americans, South Americans, Japanese, um, Allah, over 82% of the Muslim Ummah, of the uh, 1.6 billion Muslims, are non-Arab. And the vast majority of them do not know Arabic to the extent that they can phrase their own du'as or ask for their needs in their Arabic. Nor is it required for them to learn Arabic in order to phrase a du'a in the Arabic language. It is indeed sufficient to learn Arabic to be able to pray, offer the prescribed prayers and to recite the Quran and it will be great if you can understand the verses of the Quran. It is not fair whatsoever to say to somebody whose wife is giving birth and he's in need for Allah's help. So while he's praying, he's making dua in his sujood but since he doesn't know Arabic, he says, you know what, I'm not allowed to make dua. Doesn't make any sense. Yes, there is a di difference of opinion but the more right view that for non-Arab, those who do not know Arabic, it is permissible to make dua in their mother tongue, in sujood. This is other than the prescribed supplications. Prescribed supplications like, what do we say in ruku' subhana rabbi al -azim. Can I say instead, glory be to my Lord, the great? No, that would not be sufficient. Why? Because I can say it in Arabic. Every person can say it in Arabic, even non-Arab, once they accept Islam and start learning. In their sujood, in between the two sajdas, it is a must to recite this dua. رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَسَامِحْنِي وَهْدِنِي وَأَجِرْنِي وَعَافِنِي وَزُقْنِي سَمِعَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ حَمِلَ تَكْبِرَاتُ الْإِحْرَامِ So these are the prescribed invocations which you must recite it as is. But the voluntary one, making dua, Asking Allah for any need, you can do it in your mother tongue. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Farzana from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Farzana. Alaikum assalam, Sheikh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Shukla, barakallahu feek. Uh, 
has four questions to be asked. Nah. Hello. Nah. Go ahead. Yeah. If a person is in death, is it allowed to do tatka and uh, uh, sawab jaria to mosque or any Islamic foundation with little amount? Okay. Okay. And my second question is, can you please elaborate the difference between tatka and tatka jaria? Mm -hmm. And my third question is, did Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to recite zikr or tasbihat on tasbih beat? Okay. You got it? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. No. And my fourth question is, what are the specific days of sunnah fasting with regard to Arafah? Okay. Uh, can you repeat the last question, Sister Farzana? Yes. Yeah. What are the specific days of sunnah Fasting with regards to Arafah. Okay. Okay. Jazakallah. Thank please, you, sister. Only one request uh, that please include me in your dua. Please. Sure, I will, inshallah. May Allah bless you and your family, sister Farzana. Barakallah fikum. Thank you so much. Brother Sami from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi How are you, brother Sami? I'm fine. Good. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead. I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Sani. Yes. Uh, my, my, yes. My question, my question is, and my issue is that uh, if some people start salat with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, the end. Mm. And some people start with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alam. That makes Bismillah Rahman. I want to know the reason why. So, if you can help me to know much about that. Tayyip. That's my, that's my question. Okay. Barakallah feek. And thank you, brother Sani from Ghana. Sister Farzana from India. Uh, had four questions. The first one, is it permissible to give a minimal amount of charity to an Islamic organization uh, in order to be considered as a continuous charity? And then her second question was, what is the difference between the regular charity and the continuous charity or as sadaqa and as sadaqa al jariyah Answering the second question would help us to comprehend the, the first question and its answer as well. Given any charity, in general, that's called sadaqah. Okay? And uh, there are many ayat and ahadith with regards to the virtues of giving any charity. Whether the mandatory charity, the obligatory nadh, or the voluntary charity. So feeding the poor is a charity. Feeding your family is a charity. Uh, buying medication to those who cannot afford it is a charity. Helping those who are in need is a charity. Raising an orphan is, an, is a charity. The difference between the regular charity and one which is considered continuous, that the second type is continuous. As long as it is lasting, its reward is lasting along with it. Let me give you an example. Uh, Building an orphanage or assisting, not just building, assisting or participating in building an orphanage or a hospital, a school, madrasa for teaching the Quran or religious knowledge, uh, or masjid. As long as those buildings, as long as these institutes are still erected, and benefiting people, so its reward is continuous. Every time somebody benefits out of this organization, benefits out of the school, out of the hospital, out of the masjid, he prays in the masjid, his reward, if he's praying, is maintained for him. And I get a similar reward because, because of me, this place was made possible for him or her to pray in this place, for an orphan to be raised, until they grew up, they became independent, they taught them um, 
a job to do or some type of education. Then a new generation came and a third and a fourth. So as long as the benefits are continuous, then the reward of the charity is continuous. Water fountain. Dig in a water well. Inshallah, brothers who go to Africa, they dig a lot of water wells, subhanAllah. And uh, recently, some non-Muslims, Christians, came asking, can we drink from the water well as well, or is it only for Muslims? They said, of course you can. It's not exclusively for Muslims. They said, because whenever the missionary, uh, Christian missionaries come, and they dig a water well, it's only for Christians and those who become Christians. And this is very tempting for people to, be, to enter Christianity and so on. So our brothers told them, no, it's open for every person. We personally faced many situations like that. Whenever we go and we open a clinic to treat those who are sick in these poor countries and give them free medications and so on, I saw uh, some young girls and teenagers were asking, I'm not a Muslim, can I receive that treatment or do I have to become a Muslim to that extent, brothers and sisters, who say no, even if you're not Muslims. This is service for humanity. And this is a very good way of giving da'wah as well. You are ordered to help everybody. So when your assistance, this water well, uh, is still benefiting Muslims or non-Muslims, animals, birds, fit anybody, you are earning a thawab. In the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma min muslimin, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma min muslimin yagrisu gharsan, fa yakulu minhu insanun, aw tayrun, aw hayawanun, illa kana lahu bihi ajra. When a Muslim plants a tree, and this tree is fruitful, whether a human being, a bird, or an animal happen to eat from this tree, the person will continue to get thawab. So the person died. And these living creatures are still eating from the tree. Even the birds, the thawab is still continuous. Now do you know why the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, إِذَا قَامَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَفِي يَدِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَسِيلَةً فَإِنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ أَنْ يَغْرِسْهَا فَلْيَفْعَلْ Do good deeds and invest in doing good deeds, particularly the continuous good deeds, even if it is already announced that the Day of Judgment has started. The hour has been established, which means mass destruction, major demolition. So he's still... And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you have a chance, if you have a tree to plant, particularly a date palm tree, even though that you're told it's over, that is the end of the world, go ahead and plant it. You never know. Maybe somebody will benefit out of it. And that will come in the scale of your good deeds. So that is the major difference between the regular charity and the continuous charity. Somebody asked me for uh, help. So I give him my drink, or I give him my food, and he ate and he drank. That's a charity. I took him from his hand, and I took him to a job to learn uh, some handicraft, and I assisted him with some money, and he started earning. I taught him fishing, as the example says. So as long as he's benefiting from my instructions, I continue to get a reward, versus just giving him a meal or giving him a halwa or a charity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abu Bakr from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Abu Bakr from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I want to ask you. I want you to shed more light. Ya Abu Bakr, do me a favor and meet your TV. Abu Bakr, meet your TV. Naam. Naam. Okay. My question is, what is the meaning of the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ذَلِكَ وَمَيُّ عَلِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Okay. جزاك الله خير. I got your question. Naam. 
Barakallahu uh, feek. Furthermore, with regards to the continuous charity, I love a very fascinating hadith in which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and the hadith is a sound hadith and it is narrated by Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him. Man bana lillahi baytan, bana Allahu lahu baytan fil jannati wa lahu ka mafhas iqata. Whoever builds a house for Allah on earth, ya'ni a place of worship, a masjid, Allah will build a house for him in paradise in return. Why? Because building a masjid, this is a continuous charity. You may die and the masjid has been serving for another 100 years, 200 years. Recently, I saw a very interesting masjid, which I visited in Osaka, in Japan. And in a nearby city, like an hour or so driving, uh, this masjid has been built before the Second World War. And subhanallah, uh, during an earthquake, everything around it was demolished except the masjid. And during the Second World War, and they have the pictures, black and white, all the buildings were bombarded and were demolished. Only the masjid, only the masjid would stand still and it was not affected. Subhanallah, I say, it must be that the person who built that masjid invested in it from halal money, 100% halal. Can you imagine a masjid which, be, which has been there for over 100 years? The person who initiated this project, the person who built the masjid, he's, he's dead a long time ago, but his reward is continuous. That is called the continuous charity. People are coming from here and from there, entering the masjid and praying and getting a thawab. And similarly, the person who built the masjid, what if it is more than one person? That is the meaning of the hadith of Uthman ibn Affan. Because when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَلَوْ كَمَفْحَصِ قَطَى which means even if this masjid which he built was as little as a bird's nest, then still Allah will build a house for you in return in paradise. But how could I offer a prayer? How could even a baby offer a prayer in, in a bird's nest? The meaning is that if your participation in building such masjid was as little as uh, just bird, uh, uh, building a bird's nest, Yani, if 10 people participated in a masjid, all of them will be rewarded. 10,000 people, all of them will be rewarded, and each one of them will get a house built for him by Allah in paradise. Compare between this and the recent news that uh, the, the recent regime in, in, a, in a country like Egypt shut down 55,000 masjids. 55,000 masjids and they fired tens of thousands of imams and so on. So in one hand, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that if you build a house, if you participate in building a house for Allah, Allah will build a house for you and return in paradise. And on the other hand, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ وَسَعَى فِي خَرَابِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying who is more zalim, who is more in oppression, who is more in committing zulm than a person who prevented people from entering the masajid of Allah or prevented the masajid from being open 24-7 to serve the purpose of the ibadah. And he worked hard to shut it down. Such people are the worst people, as the Nabi sallallahu as the ayah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayah. So there is a major difference between the regular charity and the continuous uh, one. Um, with regards to making tasbih on the beads, I will answer this inshallah after the following phone call. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Misbah from Canada. Misbah from Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you? Uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, how are you, brother? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feek. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I have a question. No. Uh, we know that uh, if we take a, uh, make wudu before we take a shower, 
then we don't have to make uh, uzu after shower. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we take a shower in the confined place, like uh, inside the washroom, mm -hmm. but if we take off all the clothes, is it allowed to take a shower like that? Okay. Or I have to make uzu after taking shower? Okay. okay. Thank you, Brother Misbah. Barakallah feek. Making tasbih on the beads. It is definitely most preferable to make tasbih on your finger joints. Why? There is a hadith in this regard. In which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to a group of women, اعقدنا بالأنامل فإنهن مستنطقات. These finger joints which you make tasbih and you can on them your dhikr and praises of Allah and glorification of Allah by saying subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar, etc. Will be most These joints on the day of judgment will actually have the ability to speak out. To say, this guy used to make tasbih on us. So they will be protected from being touched by the fire of hell. This is uh, one of the virtues of making tasbih on one's finger joints. But it doesn't mean it is not permissible to make tasbih on the beads, as long as it is just to keep record. Using the misbaha for doing so is permissible. It has been narrated. Some of the companions used to count on the pebbles from one hole to another. But if the person is using this as a mean of show off, showing off, especially those who exaggerate in the prices of the tasbih, some of them the prices reach a thousand, two, and three, then definitely it is prohibited. This is uh, showing off uh, those who keep the, the affordable one just to make, to keep record, especially for the adhkar of the morning and in the evening, uh, it is permissible. We'll take a short break, and inshallah, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Sister Farzana from India, her fourth question was about the sunnah of fasting on the day of Arafah and which date is it? The day of Arafah is the ninth day of the month of Dhul Hijjah. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, Al Hajj Arafah. The main pillar of Hajj is to be in the valley of Arafah whether it's standing or sitting down or reclining or lying down, but in Arafah. Normally, the term Al-Wukufu bi Arafah is used, but it does not necessarily mean to keep standing. Okay. When does this happen? On the ninth day. The tenth is the day of the Eid. The eighth is the day of at tarwiya So that is the day of Arafah. Now, the, the very common question will be, like exactly before Ramadan, when should we fast it? But in Ramadan, it's much more common because it's a whole month. So people care a lot about the beginning of Ramadan and the ending of Ramadan and the beginning of Shawwal, which is the Eid, and so on. So if you simply follow the Hajjij, the pilgrims, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so if you fast on the day of Arafah, because the Hajjij, the pilgrims, are in Arafah on that day, that is the day of Arafah. And the reward for fasting on such day, as it is narrated in the sound hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, fasting on the day of Arafah expiates the sins of two years, the past year and the year to come, SubhanAllah. So forgiveness in advance for the sins of the upcoming year. The day of Arafah is the greatest day. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, the greatest dua is the dua of the day of Arafah. And the greatest supplication or type of dua is to say, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahun mulk wa lahul hamd, yuhi wa yumitu, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. I assume that all of you know the great meaning of this supplication. Okay. Uh, Sani from Ghana. Al basmala. Al basmala means to recite Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Al-Basmala is not an ayah of every surah of the Qur'an. Rather, it is 
an ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha only and with regards to the rest of the surahs, it is used as a separation to distinguish the end of the surah from the beginning of the following surah. But also there are some scholars who consider Al-Basmala not an ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha. In any case, according to the vast majority of the scholars, the recitation of Al-Basmala as an ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha is a must. Because the recite in Surah Al-Fatiha, the whole surah, is one of the pillars of As-Salah, which means if one does not recite Surah Al-Fatiha or any of its ayat, the prayer will be invalid. Even if he does it out of forgetfulness, then in this case, he is required to repeat the whole rak'ah because of one of its pillars was missing, even if it is only one ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha. So you should recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Maybe also your question is concerning some imams do not recite it. No, in fact they do. But they follow the opinion of Al-Jumhur with regards to reciting Al-Basmala secretly or not out loud, especially in the loud prayers. Only according to Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i, you should do Al-Jahru Bil-Basmala, which means to recite it out loud if you're an imam, exactly like the rest of the surah. So what most of the imams, other than the followers of Shafi'i Madhab, they do recite Al-Basmala, but they recite it in themselves, not out loud. Then they do the Jahr with the rest of the ayat of Surah Al-Fatiha. Either case is permissible. Um, there was a question last uh, episode. The sister inquired about the difference between Al-Talaq, Al-Ibra, and the Idda. Uh, Al-Talaq, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Al-Talaq marratan fa'im sa'kum bima'roofin aw tasrihum bi'ihsan. And there is a whole surah in the Quran which is known as Surah Al-Talaq or the minor women surah, Surah Nisa al surah because it describes the legal, uh, legalization of uh, divorce and how should one do it. Which means it is permissible whenever it is a last resort, a separation. Okay. In normal cases, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah, الطلاق مرتان فإمساكم بمعروف أو تسريح بإحسان The husband has the right to divorce his wife two times. These two times are revocable. يعني if he decided to change his mind within the idda, which is your third question, the idda is a waiting period for the divorcee that she is not allowed to accept any marriage proposals or even talk about it because she's still waiting for the idda to elapse. The idda is either either three periods or three months for women who do not experience uh, the period. So in this case, if he decided before uh, the idda is over to take her back to his marriage life, then automatically she is his wife even without her consent. That is the meaning of at-talaq maratan. Only two times he has the right to do that. The third time is irrevocable. If he utters divorce in the third time, he doesn't have any right to take her back even with her consent even if the guardian and every person agrees, because it's over, okay? فَلَا تَحِلُّ لَهُ مِنْ بَعْدُ حَتَّى تَنْكِحَ زَوْجًا غَيْرَ And that's another long story. Uh, if she marries somebody else legally, okay, then if the marriage does not really work out and she got divorced and after the idda she's free, not prearranged, because if it is prearranged, the whole process is invalid and they're all cursed. But if it happens naturally, fine. Al-Ibra, in, in the case of At-Talaq, then the wife has rights, which is an nafaqa that he, she has rights uh, upon her husband that he should spend on her as long as she's in the idda. And as-sukna la tukhrijuhunna min buyutihinna wa la yakhrujn illa yatina bifahishati mubayyina. That you're not allowed because you divorce your wife to kick her out. It's my property, it's in my name. We don't live in America, she doesn't have any right here. No, she does. As long as she's in the idda, even if she does not have children, 
she must stay in the same house she will live in until the idda is over. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And as long as she's living under your roof, you must support her financially. But I already divorced her. I don't want to see her anymore. That's her right. And also, if she still have some deferred amount of the dowry, she must collect it as well. Guess what? Al-Ibra is like the khula. If the wife decided to give up on all of her rights in order to get divorced, and accordingly, she would not, she would waive all her rights of the sukna, of the financial support, uh, all of that. And meanwhile, in return, the talaq will be irrevocable. It's like fasq, like khula. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Rahma from Niger. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have two questions. Naam. The first question is, uh, once I take the last part for uh, the, this question, please can you repeat for me? Uh, it's uh, ap uh, about a period uh, while doing Umrah or Hajj. Because last April I did Umrah, but I have some spot of blood. I stop again when I clean again like this gum. Can you clear it for me? Uh, the second question, is uh, like uh, if you mix two but like uh, for a period and for a, for a, uh, two two birthday I mean like after period or after baking, giving birth like that or for Juma prayer you mix two two but how we will do to this but take this but we have to take two intention to do one but or each one will to wash your one by one. Uh, uh, I got your first part. The first part of your question, but the later part, I didn't get it still, Sister Rahma. Can you repeat yes. it, please? Yeah, the first one is, uh, like, uh, last April, Alhamdulillah, I did Umrah. But while doing Umrah, I have some spots of blood, not like as usual, my period. But it's coming, the spot after something, then it stop. I clean again, I go. So I want to know how is it, uh, the period with the Umrah. How I, I, I already got your what? first question. I got your first question. If uh, I was just asking. Okay. To you to repeat your second question or clarify it. Yeah, the second the second question is like if you mix two but like for Janaba or for and uh, for period and uh, for uh, Janaba and Juma with bat like that. How we will do this? But we take this bat. We have to take each intention to take bat, or we can take one intention to do. Two I bat. see. I see. Okay. Barakallahu feek. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to answer your questions because both of them are kind of long and maybe confusing so that the, the viewers would know what we're talking about. That's why I'm going to skip the order just for this question. In April, she was performing Umrah and afterward, she found some spotting. If that happened after you performed the Umrah, your Umrah is valid and you're not, you're not required to repeat it. Nor are you required to investigate when did this happen. If spotting happened before performing the tawaf because the only pillar which requires a tahara is a tawaf for the ihram it does not require tahara for the sa'i it does not require tahara so even if the person in a woman in major impurity like the menses she can still do the ihram and she can still do the sa'i if it was not during the period time and just spotting and it stopped you treat it like a uh, Istihada, irregular bleeding, and in this case, you will just uh, take a bath and uh, purify yourself and perform your tawaf, then followed by sa'i. And you can do this whether in umrah or hajj or with regards to the prayer. And it does not stop you from observing your fasting because this is not the regular period, rather, it is called an irregular bleeding. Um, she's also asked in, in the second question that if she has an overlap between two things, nifas, which is a post-delivery bleeding, and right away, that is followed by the regular period. And now in order to take, and the period is over, the bleeding has stopped. In order to perform ghusl, is she required to perform two ghusl? One, to remove the major impurity of the postpartum, a bleeding and also another one for the period. No, one ghusl is enough to lift all the major and the minor impurities. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you, Sister Rahma. Um, 
Brother Abu Bakr from uh, Nigeria, I believe, he inquired about one of the beautiful ayat of Surah Al-Hajj. ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same surah with regards to magnifying or ta'zim or respecting or treating as sacred حُرُمَاتِ الله حُرُمَاتِ الله is the things which are, are the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either makes sacred or make prohibited حرمات الله for instance مكة is حرم what does it mean مكة is حرم once you enter the حرم this is a sacred place you should avoid all type of sins and there are specific sins that they have been mentioned in the hadith for instance you're not allowed to break or remove any tree or cut any plant or scare any bird it's a peaceful place the most peaceful place you're not allowed to indulge into a false argument. You're not allowed to uh, dispute. It's a haram. Then there is another sacred condition which you commence into it through making ihram. So you are in a sacred time and in a sacred place, whether due to performing umrah and also due to performing hajj, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever magnifies and treats with respect either the hurumat or in this ayah sha'air Allah sha'air Allah like what? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna as-safa wal marwata min sha'air Allah Surah Al-Baqarah what does it mean? as-safa wal marwa the two hills the two mountains are of the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds us with the, uh, uh, with the iman, with the belief, with the trust and confidence that Hajar, peace be upon her, had in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds us of the whole story because we are following the footsteps of Hajar when we go between as safa and al Marwa. Before Hajar السلام, made this journey, um, who cares about as safa and al Marwa? Just two mountains in Mecca. But afterward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed as sa'i فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ اعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا وَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Aisha Umm al-Mu'mineen radiyallahu anha stated that it means you must perform sa'i At-tawaf here, yattawwafa baynahuma to perform sa'i between as-safa wal marwa. It's a must. It's a pillar in Umrah and it's a pillar in Hajj. Another sha'ira, maqamu Ibrahim. Fihi ayatun bayinatun maqamu Ibrahim. There are many sha'ir uh, slaughtering the Hajj. I want to go back to the ayah of Surah Al-Hajj. Look, وَمَا يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ one who treats the symbols which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considered as references and symbols or ayat, whether due to the place or due to the time, this is a sign of righteousness. His heart is righteous. Look at the following ayah. لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّا ثُمَّ مَحِلُّهَا إِلَىٰ الْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ then Allah is talking about the Hajj. You may benefit uh, out of the Hajj to a certain term. Then afterward, you sacrifice al hajj in the Haram. Okay? Mahilluha ila al bayt al atiq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this regard, لَن يَنَالَ اللَّهَ لُحُومُهَا وَلَا دِمَاؤُهَا وَلَكِنْ يَنَالُهُ التَّقْوَى مِنْكُمْ When we slaughter our hajj, look at the ayat from Al-Baqarah to Al-Hajj to Al-An'am to whatever. We link the ayat together. When we slaughter our hajj, we say this is for the sake of Allah. Does it mean that we're giving a piece of the meat to Allah or the blood? Neither the flesh nor the blood of our sacrifices of our hajj would reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
ولكن يناله التقوى منكم what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets from you what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, receives from you is righteousness is righteousness and he made this animal subservient to you لتكبروا الله على ما هداكم in order to magnify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this sha'ira so the hajj is full of sha'ar the, hal- the hajj is full of sha'ar or symbols one should treat that with respect not as some sort of rituals Allah is inviting us that whenever we're performing hajj and umrah to reflect and ponder upon each sha'ira think what is the significance of that why do we do it let me give you another example maqam ibrahim when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fihi ayatun bayyinatun maqam ibrahim wa man dakhalahu kana amina al masjid al haram is full of clear and obvious signs among those signs maqam ibrahim the station of ibrahim alayhi salam what is it it's a stone which has a footmark or footprint of Ibrahim alayhi salam while he was building the Kaaba in order to outreach a higher level he asked Ismail to bring him a rock or a stone and he stepped on it in order to outreach so it has his footprint again instead that's why it is put there in the past it was open every person can see it and touch it but you know some people have the tendency to magnify even stones and rocks even though we're going to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it is put in this showcase but some people still consider it like a sacred thing in a sense that they seek the blessings out of that so some people will take their ihram off and they wipe it against the showcase the window the glass or shine the gold uh, the golden uh, color again is that by their ihram or a woman would take her scarf off and when she goes home she make sure that you wrap me in the coffin in this that's insignificant not only that you are doing the opposite of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ one stone we throw with another stone and one stone we kiss it because the Prophet Sallallahu kissed it and honored it not because it benefits or prevents against any harm that's why Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu an when he came to receive the black stone and kissed it he said by Allah I know that you're just a stone you neither benefit nor harm nor protect against any harm have I not seen the Prophet Sallallahu kissing you I wouldn't have done so brothers and sisters by that we come to the end of this edition but I guess in the last couple of seconds I can answer Misbah not to have any pending questions um, performing wudu if you're taking a shower in the bathroom itself is permissible what about al basmala you can say it in yourself without having to utter it and that will be sufficient inshallah since al basmala according to the more right view is sunnah not a fard or a rokan in the purification or tahara as long as you intend to perform wudu then the wudu is valid even if it was just mere shower not performing ghusl aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh allah is my heart speech your mercy is what i be seen